was growing up. There was just, I don't know that at the time I felt I wanted to do polar ex at work at all, but I've always loved the Arctic. I've always loved cold places. And so this idea that this was something that was something people did, not something that I necessarily had to you know, dream up myself, so to speak. So uh, the other image is just me on polar bear watch last summer. So actually in the Arctic rather than camping out on the beach. So uh, this here is uh, Donald McMillan, Captain Mac, Don Dan, to uh, people in town. He lived in Freeport from uh, the late 1800s when he moved here as a young teenager after the deaths of his parents. He came up to, uh, to stay with his sister, older sister, who is the house of the White Cedar Inn in town. So that's a place that, that still stands that some of you may, may know. And he lived in town until about 1970, or he died in 1970 when he was 95. So here he is on the deck of the Bowdoin schooner. The Bowdoin schooner was built in 1921, specifically for Arctic work. And it was con uh, commissioned by Macmillan for, for the purposes of, of going into ice, ice boundary regions. It's 88 feet and 60 tons. So it's a fairly heavy boat, double-sided, uh, double-framed white oak, extra large rudder to have some maneuverability because what, what they were finding in bringing ships into ice boundary regions is they tended to be too big for having enough maneuverability and that, yeah, they couldn't get around in cramped locations. And they also used so much fuel for the size. So this was, how do we make a small boat that's, extra, that's quite maneuverable? And to me, being young, looking at boats, it, it's obviously, you know, it doesn't have a bow sprit. It's got this crow's nest on the foremast and has other things that really made it stand out to think about how was, how was that boat designed. So I also, both in, while in high school, I had the opportunity to crew on this boat and on the Ernestina, which was the uh, time FEM Morrissey, which was the other is still the other existing polar schooner today. So there's two of them afloat, or the Ernestina will be afloat once it gets some repairs again. But uh, the Ernestina was commissioned by Bob ba uh, Bartlett, who is from Newfoundland and was on the support team with Admiral, uh, with Admiral Perry in his 1909 polar expedition. And that, that boat may be notable, it's currently in Massachusetts, but it may be notable for the ballad that was written in 1913 by one of the crew members called The Log of the Record Run, which is a, describing the 225 pass mile passage made in 18 and a half hours in gale force winds. And the song in that boat, in that song, the boat's name was changed to Mary L. McKay because uh, prohibition was still going on in Maine. So they had to do it a little bit secretly. But uh, that song is well known around here through bands such as Schooner Fair when they sang it. So I, though, was looking at an expedition 37 years prior to Peary's 1909 North Pole expedition. And so before Matthew Henson, Peary, and the four Inuit with whom they were traveling stepped to the North Pole, uh, this man, Adolf Elik Nordenschuld, led a Swedish expedition to attempt to get to the North Pole. And he didn't make it. And so the expedition that we recreated in some ways was an expedition to failure. But he also has been credited with uh, sort of the discovery, so to speak, of the Northeast Passage, of the Northern route along Russia, as well as finding other islands in the Arctic. So. That was our little recreation there. So here you can see. So it, I, no, I won't step away from this, actually. Don't need to. So a bit of a uh, map of different of the polar expeditions. So the one that we recreated came up from Scandinavia to get to the poles that way. And they made it about that far. So just shy of the Arctic, of the North Pole. Peary, on the other hand, came up through Canada and Greenland and made it that way. 
So yeah, um, I think I was about 10 minutes into my first tire trek last January, a year ago, January, when the police pulled me over to say that they could just put the tire in the back of their car and take me to wherever I broke it down. Um, so after that, I decided maybe Main Street or Bow Street wasn't exactly the best route for tire dragging. Uh, so that is Vaughn Street in the upper corner in Portland, but otherwise, uh, Pettengill and somewhere, uh, I think the other one's my backyard. But uh, t t pulling tires is sort of the standard of polar expeditions today, training. It's just, it simulates a lot of what pulling a sled is like. And that's, so for that type of expedition, that is. I had to obviously name my tires because I was spending a lot of time with them. <laughs> so the, uh, the first one, the one closest to me was named Roll. Uh, partly after Roald Amundsen, so to have some polar expedition there, but also because it is a tire, uh, Liz Ring provided those for me, and she said it's an old truck tire that doesn't work anymore. So I figured it had rolled, it no longer rolls, so it can be rolled in that way. Uh, the one behind me, the second one was named Scott, after Captain Robert Falcon Scott, because Scott and Amundsen were in a race to the South Pole, and they were out at the same time trying to get there. And whenever I went down a hill in the ice, the second tire tried to beat the first one, and they inevitably both banged me in the back of the knees, and I'd fall over. So the, I had a third tire. It never really earned its name. I tried to ascribe one to it, but it didn't really, didn't really happen. Uh, but yeah, training, I mean, training was all sorts of, all sorts of things. I, a lot of fitness, time in the gym, but sort of all of that built around pulling tires. Uh, fitness training in the 18, 1900s on expeditions was much more geared toward uh, military type fitness, taking people who were in the military and doing a lot of training anyway, and then they would join these expeditions. But that said, Shackleton specifically brought somebody on his expedition who was effectively a personal trainer for the team. And uh, as part of this, one of the, uh, in some ways, least physically, more mentally taxing was uh, learning to shoot a rifle. I carried a 308 rifle and shotgun. And so I had to carry that. I got quite the bruise in the black eye from not quite figuring out how to balance the, uh, the scope properly before it recoiled into my face. Um, but I got to go out with L.L. Bean a few times a bit to their testing grounds and learn about, it. they basically said, I told, I told them what kind of rifle I would have and they went through their shop and figured out what they had. And we went out and tested, tested that. So that was it, was, it was fun. It was interesting. I was unprepared, I guess, for how visceral it would feel shooting a rifle. I've never shot anything before. And, you know, shooting at target practice was totally fine. And then my first day out in the snow uh, in Svalbard, we created sort of mounds of snow to represent polar bears. And polar bears have a very different anatomy to other bears. And if you need to shoot one, which obviously we didn't want to do, but if you need to shoot one, you need to actually shoot it to kill it. And so we had to demonstrate our prowess at that. And so suddenly here I was, you know, with this ice mound and they've marked out where the different parts of the polar bear are and I need to actually kill it. And I was more nauseous doing that than I think I've been at any point in the past year. So, um, but that said, you know, polar bears are endangered species. You don't want to actually, we don't want to kill them. And even, you know, seeing them, we want to see them, but safely. So we had about nine, I think, I think, an actual rifle was about ranked nine, ninth in our uh, polar bear security system. We had flare guns. We had, you know, keep watch. Polar bears, unlike other other bears, other species, they they don't see people and think, you know, pigs in a blanket. If we were in a tent, um, that other bears, you know, may recognize that they are not familiar with people, so they don't know what we are. And that means that they are generally quite curious. So they may come near a camp and kind of scope it out a little bit, might leave, might come back. And it's really when, it, when the bear is coming back again and again that you're like, hmm, it's getting a little bit braver. This is where you don't want to be. 
But that generally means you see one, watch it. And because it's only really if it gets interested in us, then we think, well, maybe we should just move camp and just show that we're not interested in it. And usually that deters it pretty well. But also, yeah, I did have uh, a bear fence that bear fence was, I'll show in a moment, really close to our tent, which to me was a little bit unnerving because like if that gets triggered, that means there's a bear in camp, not a bear away from camp. And you know, if you're sleeping with your rifle and you have to suddenly get a bear that's already in camp, it felt a little bit like I didn't quite know how this game of Tetris was gonna work. So uh, yeah, McMillan used a trap, trapdoor Springfield rifle with, that he had, and that is available for viewing in Rockland at the Sea Power and Steam Museum, apparently. So, uh, so they, they relied on very similar, similar methods. Uh, so this is just a couple other, other images of, of some of our training. I spent some time in northern Sweden uh, in some of the ice, um, sorry, the, the mountains there. And so learning how to pull a polka, so the sled, unlike, unlike uh, early expeditions that had really big, heavy, heavy uh, wooden sleds that they used and would have dogs carry them, for example, we tied our sleds to our waists and went ourselves. Had some really, really, really gorgeous views, um, but also the lower image was me learning how to dig myself into the snow and make a personal snow cave. So if the, yeah, for, for bad weather. So an image of, our, of my tent at night. Didn't get to see the aurora in the, in the uh, polar, actual polar expedition because it was there in the, in the summer, spring and summer. So this image is uh, taken by McMillan and it was about crossing, crossing a lead. So a lead is a gap in sea ice. And sea ice is one of those things that if you, you know, if you drive over near a river in the winter and you see the sort of tides that have pushed up different blocks of ice, that's sort of what sea ice is like. It's not nice ice for cruising over. It's, so lots of clamoring around, lots of climbing over ice. That's actually what caused the expedition that I retraced to fail to make the North Pole because they couldn't actually physically get over the ice. So uh, I Perry about this, this photograph was uh, talking about that he had five sledges. And so, so they, they went off on their team and then they would sort of knock off people as they'd go. So the people who would sort of go out and clear the path and set up camp and then the core team would go and so not everybody, there were only six of them. Uh, first by Matthew Henson and Harry, who actually made, made it to the, to the pole. But with the six of them, they ended up with five sledges and 40 dogs with them. Uh, they went on their trip with 246 dogs. And <laughs> so some of the dogs were uh, food sources, uh, which was a really common, common mechanism in both Antarctic and Arctic expeditions was that you could have dogs, they would pull your gear, and uh, if they got injured, that was a bit of food you didn't have to carry with you from the beginning. And so, yeah, so that was sort of a grimmer, a grimmer discovery, I guess. We thought about bringing dogs with us, not for that purpose, uh, but mainly for polar bear deterrence. And the idea being that dogs have a great sense of smell and can tell us if a bear is coming. In reality, it kind of depends on the temperament of the dog. And we discovered that a lot of dogs don't really care. <laughs> and so I was talking with a friend of mine who did an expedition the year prior, and she took two dogs, Prinsen and Princessum. And she said probably by the name, she should have known they should have left them behind. But they refused to carry their own food. Well, she was hoping, as have others, that you know you can you can have the dog, you can strap a sled to the dog, much like you might have a dog sled, dog sled team. They would carry their own food. Turns out that they're not great generally if you're on a ski expedition of having them carry their own food. So you end up carrying their own food as well, and then it's controlling them and so that they don't run off. Because we were we were at times 
you know, if we made two kilometers an hour, so, you know, one and a half miles, a bit over one and a half miles an hour, like that was considered great timing. Uh, so dogs weren't generally happy with that pace. But uh, yeah, my friend was talking about how they had Princeton and Princessen, and the dogs would, they tried to have the dogs sleep on either side of the tent, either side of the camp, but the dogs would go absolutely bananas unless they were together. And then when they were together, they were happy with any polar bear that came into camp. So <laughs> they, uh, they dropped, they detoured a little bit where they were going and were able to come up to a, uh, a research site and they dropped the dogs, the dogs there and they said it was significantly, significantly easier. So after, after that and a few other stories, we decided not to bring, not to bring dogs. Uh, that said, we did also, we did have our own ice leads. So this is melting sea ice. We actually had a call for rescue eventually uh, to get off the sea ice uh, because it was melting so quickly. But you can just see in that bottom image that uh, that was our, our technical guide. And there's two parts, two sections of sea ice with, a, you know, I don't know how deep that would be, but straight down into the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. And we had times where, you know, skiing through ice that was a slush, mid, mid, mid calf, knee level, that, so. Um, and we, so, so they had, you know, they would come along the, 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 the open ice. One reason they brought dogs was dogs were a lot more sensitive to that information, in, to the conditions. And so they felt dogs were a, a big safety net for them as well, of just keeping them, keeping them up. We had things like GPS and, tech and uh, radar and the Norwegian Meteorological Institute sending us images like this, uh, that or this is just Svalbard right here, uh, what the ice conditions look like. So the red there is pretty stable ice. So that's stuff you can go and camp out on. And, but you can see a little bit of the green areas in the north and that's, Area that's more caution, cautious areas, and then the blue and white is liquid. So, what? Good question. The gray. Uh, the sorry, the gray is land. Sorry, um, ice, but land, you know, land ice. Sorry. So, um, yeah, Perry wrote about about that at one point, saying as Borup, who was one of the, one of his crew was getting his team across the open crack between two pieces of floating ice. The dog slipped and went into the water, and leaping forward. You know, the vigorous young athletes stopped the sledge from following, following the dogs and catching hold of the traces, so the, the lines holding onto the dogs, that fastened the dogs to the sledge. And as he pulled them, he, he pulled them bodily out of the water. A man less quick and muscular than Borup might have lost the whole team as well as the sledge, laden with 500 pounds of supplies which considering our position far out in the icy wilderness were worth far more to us than their weight in diamonds. So, you know, talking about some of these issues that they had about, you know, falling into the ice were some of the same ones that we were, we were dealing with. And they would run, so they had their sled about 500 pounds. Mine that I pulled was about 150 pounds. So still a fair chunk more than I weigh, uh, which, you know, taking it, uphills, which was just tiring work, and then downhills, which is more exhilarating in the sense that it would go faster than I would, and uh, it would like to wedge itself between my knees, uh, sometimes without forewarning. But they would run dogs in sort of a fan formation, so not sort of a standard two by two that we think of with dog sledding here, and just because out in the open ice, when you have the dogs that are all independent, they have a lot more ability to navigate around obstacles, like piled up ice or open leads, whereas if they're two by two, they're really, really trail, trail running where they need to be in a narrow area. So this is, this is an image that we took uh, as we were buttoning down for a storm. Uh, but one thing that I think one of the, initial challenges I had that hit me really on the first day when I had food that was dehydrated camping, basically dehydrated camping food, and I just couldn't boil water. And I'm melting snow, trying to melt snow, and it's just, if 
finally got it in a liquid form, but I just couldn't get it warm. And so I poured it into my, my pouch of food and it never, it, since it wasn't hot, it, it, the food ended up just being soupy and gritty. But you know, it's one of those where you're just appreciating the calories more than anything else. But having stoves that just weren't working, and I was just feeling like I was the perpetual idiot for the first week or so where I could get my stove lit and it just wasn't getting hot or it would flame up. And, you know, we're, we're doing this inside our tents. These tents are effectively the same thing you get at LLV and they're not exactly fireproof. So that was always a little bit exciting. Uh, but it turned, it turned out, we didn't realize this at the time, that we were using fuel, effectively gasoline, basically. And we had shipped some to us and it didn't arrive. So we had to get fuel locally and the fuel that was available locally was quite poor quality. And so it was quite gritty. So it kept clogging the stoves, but it wasn't until about a week when somebody else had stove issues that we started actually figuring out what was going on. I thought, you know, it's just, I would clean my stove and it would do the same thing again, but we'd have to sometimes clean stoves three or four times a day. And, you know, we'd, we'd spend probably about eight, seven, eight hours a day boiling water, which was always, was a little bit of a weird experience being in the Arctic, talk, researching melting ice and then actually lighting it on fire and melting it. <laughs> so, but uh, it was kind of nice to know that stove issues are something that, that uh, have been going on for a long time. So Macmillan was speaking about how in 1909 that he also had stove issues. And he mentioned it to Perry, who was captain of the ship. And Perry said, well, what do you mean? It works perfectly. Which is basically the same reaction that I got when I said I have stove issues. And so it turned out that for them, they had tested the stoves on the boat. They were using a new technology that hadn't been tested in the Arctic before, cold environments. And it was an alcohol-based stove with no wick. And it turned out that when the temperature got so low, the alcohol didn't vaporize. So it didn't actually ignite. So it was nice to have some, you know, some of these issues, issues actually in common. So that was us after a blizzard. So I'll back up for a minute. So one, you know, Macmillan, Peary, Nordenshul, everybody of the 18, late 1800s, mid 1800s, early 1900s, really was in sort of a steeplechase of expeditions, exploration. It was you know, the era of exploration, it was European Americans getting to the poles, but making those discoveries, so to speak. So a lot of the money, a lot of the interest was in basically going and planting a flag. And that's a lot of what these expeditions were. Now it's much more about actually doing research. There was some research done in, done at that in those early stages as well, but not really until about the 1920s or so did research become something of a reason to go rather than just charting new waters and finding new places to put flags. Uh, so, but uh, Macmillan was part of some research in 1923. He was sponsored by the National, Ge uh, National Geographic Society to study advancing ice in the region because they were concerned about a new ice age coming. So they sent him up on a boat to measure it out. Uh, we did, ours was both both the uh, retracing of this expedition, but also, also research. And actually the retracing of the expedition was a lot of the research because in the 1870s, there was great interest to prove that one had gotten to the North Pole. You know, this was gonna be the first expedition we, they needed to prove it happened. So they took detailed, amazingly detailed notes, uh, diary entries to the degree that we know what they ate. We know who got lead poisoning from the food packaging. We know the name of the 39 reindeer and in the order in which they ran off. Uh, and the one named Christer that didn't run off um, didn't become dinner for anybody either. And also photographs to prove again that this is what they had seen, this is where they were. So we now have all of that data, which is incredible archival material to say, this is what it looked like in 1870, this is what it looks like now. And reading, reading the text, so there was a lot of a lot of that sort of this versus that, but also did did our own our, our own researches research. Uh, so I was involved in several several studies, one of which no I'll talk about actually I'm talk about that in a minute, but yeah I'll talk about that in a minute. So 
Uh, but some of the other issues that we had in both related to the change in climate and also previous expedition was routes, routing. So the expedition we were tracing didn't make it because there was too much sea ice. We basically didn't make it because there was not enough sea ice. And we had to reroute ourselves. We made six different routing, routing changes within about six weeks. And some of those were condition-based condition as in not actually having snow or ice to ski on. And others were con uh, conditions weather, weather-based. So this is an image of six of five of us. We dug, this is another dugout in the snow where we made these uh, snow, snow caves that would keep us, keep us safe when, when winds got higher than about 73, 74, about a, about a category one hurricane. So when, temp when conditions got worse than that, and completely white out blizzard, uh, we could dig ourselves into the snow. This one was the first one we made, and it was made with a little bit more, uh, let's say, not maybe as much wisdom as it could have been made with. I went to sleep, and you can see that we're all you know, sitting up there fairly comfortably. I went to sleep lying on one of those platforms, and I woke up with the snow about three inches off of my chest or the roof of it. So uh, we learned a lot about uh, stability and maybe how big these things can be. But we tried to, we tried to get everybody in there. But uh, yeah, we did have to reroute from the weather a few times. We did have a tent snap from wind that we probably should have said we're going to dig ourselves into the snow and not not have the tent. Uh, we had about fifty thousand dollars worth of audio equipment in the tent when it snapped, which did a really madly mad all hands on deck uh, rescue of of the tent and all of the equipment. But uh, this is this is the schooner Bowden. So you can see the kind of see the little crow's nest and the foremast right above top, uh, but they also created snow mounts and igloo style structures to keep both the condition, both weather and also polar bears out from joining them down below. So it's kind of kind of fun to sort of be relying on the same same types of structures. And yeah, here I am just building a snow wall. So this would be a wall that would go around our tent, especially in the direction from the wind. And that would basically just pull the wind and drifting snow around the tent rather than onto it. But yeah, just digging in and grabbing blocks of, blocks of snow. So the same techniques that they were using back then as well. Uh, polar bears. This was actually the only polar bear I met. It was kind of disappointing, but it was very cuddly and very sweet. So we were, we were going to be in an area. Polar bears live right on the coast. They rely on seals. They are changing their food a little bit with the changing climate in this area. And, but largely speaking, they're right along the coast. And we were going to be in an area with probably seeing 40, 50, maybe even 100 bears a day, uh, which is just sort of, you know, just have to watch them all, to watch how they're relating to us as we're migrating along. And again, moving at our one and a half miles per hour rate. And so then we got weather uh, alerts about a really bad storm coming through. And we were like, hmm, do we want to be in a whiteout condition with no polar bears? I mean, with not able to see polar bears until, you know, you got two black eyes, or do we want to not? And we chose the latter. So we had the option of either heading out into the sea ice or heading up into land in the glaciers. So we chose that, and that's the image I showed earlier about one of the blizzards that buried our tents was, was what came out after that. So avoided polar bears successfully, but uh, have to go back, obviously. And this is just an image of a campsite, our first campsite that we set up. And you can see maybe the wooden stakes around it, which is the bear fence. So we'd have this, this fence. This fence was much more for us. It wouldn't scare the bears at all. And it actually would short circuit when it got too cold. And so when we were in temperatures up to about 50 below, we, it, was, it was another tool. It wasn't something that we ever really felt we could rely on. The main concern we had and this is an image from Antarctica, so it's not one I've taken, but just a better example than the photos that I have 
or crevasses. So a crevasse is a big, basically a, a gap in, in the ice, especially on glaciers. And uh, you don't want to fall into one. So there are certainly, just as, just as Boric had done in Peary's expedition, he led, you know, falling into one is, or having a sled fall into one is certainly retrievable, but it takes a bit of training. So one of the other aspects of our training was how to get out of crevasses, how to get teammates out of crevasses. And what we had in the winter, crevasses aren't so much of a concern because we generally had snow bridges. Snow bridges are snow that, just a sound, snow that bridges the crevasse, but snow that would cover them and you could ski over them without any issue. When this, everything starts to melt, however, those bridges become really thin and you can fall through them. But the challenge is, is that you don't know where the crevasse is under, you don't know what you're standing on or whether that's a crevasse or not a crevasse. So we would, you know, keep our skis on at all times just to disperse weight, never, never get out the skis unless we had really assessed out the area. And I uh, would also rope up so that we were, we were in skiing along all tied together so that if one person did fall in, you're not only just having their sled that can keep them up, but you're having the rest of the team that's all attached. And uh, we did have one campsite, I think it was our final, final campsite that we set up where we had assessed it out and then one, one person just jumped out of the tent and one leg went right into a crevasse and we're not sure how we missed that one, but you know, they were sort of always, always there. So it was, that was probably one of our biggest, biggest safety concerns. So just talking a little bit about science, I guess right now, the Arctic is a region to me that's quite appealing as sort of getting away from the expedition side because it's warming about four times faster than the rest of the planet. And in this part of the Arctic where I was, it's about seven times faster than the rest of the planet. This is just a map of uh, climate tipping points. And what we're looking at here is that we've got 16 tipping points around the planet. Nine of them are polar. So the polar regions have a lot of gravity in the trajectory of, of the environment. And also of those, of those nine, six of them are in the five of, sorry, five of them are likely to the threshold of tip them is going to be crossed within the uh, Paris agreements. So, and they have global implications. Some tipping points are relatively regional and others are global. So a regional, for example, it could could be local changes in precipitation patterns. Global could be sea level rise that impacts everyone around the world. Uh, Greenland is currently the world's largest contributor to sea level rise. And we've shown that we've locked in about 10 inches of sea level melt, sea level rise from just how we've destabilized the ice sheet so far. And there was a study that came out yesterday, not, yeah, over the weekend, saying that you know we're we're getting, they're starting to be able to pin down a lot more that's coming from that. So the region, reason that the polar regions, especially the Arctic are so specific in this is that we are having, we're creating various feedback loops. So that's, you know, set one thing off and it triggers something else. And one of those is the loss of Arctic ice. When you have the dark ocean, the dark ocean is exposed, more radiation is absorbed in rather than reflected away. From the, from the earth. So that, that change in albedo affect the loss of albedo. Also having permafrost thaw, which releases other greenhouse gases that creates more trapping of warming, warming air, et cetera. So lots of, lots of work to be done, done here. So on our expedition, we went with six people and two of us were scientists on the science team, two doing a documentary about it and then two on the guiding side. So this is Eric, who's a glaciologist. And we were studying, he's measuring uh, depth of certain areas, certain parts of the glacier over different seasons here. And glaciers are moving. You know, we say is, you know, something moves as slow as ice or moving at a glacial speed. But what we're finding increasingly is that glacial speed is a lot speedier than we're ascribing to. We're getting glaciers that are what we're calling surging. 
And that means that a glacier that might, mean it might move a meter a day can move up to 100 or even 1,000 times faster than that. So you could have a part of, I mean, this could mean you pitch your tent. If you, if you were to pitch your tent on a glacier that's in surge, you might wake up a kilometer down the, you know, down, down the area. Um, we're having this issue, certainly this is one of our concerns being on the sea ice. You pitch your tent and you can wake up 12 miles in the wrong direction. But that's, you know, sea ice and drift and that's different. But when you're looking at actual glaciers, uh, one of the big problems, of course, is when they move that quickly, they're more prone to cracking and then you get more crevasses and other, other concerns. So, but that, that happens a lot when the, when the glaciers start to melt and basically you've got melt water that accumulates at the base of the glacier and helps lubricate it a bit. So that was one of the uh, one of the projects that we were we were looking on at. We were also looking at the chemicals in the water. So you know we've had a lot in the media about Maine with the PFAS, the forever chemicals. You know we have basically been able to get those into the water systems and into the atmosphere that we are finding those in the Arctic and in Antarctica. So in an area that you think is you know thousands of miles from any civilization, it actually has all of our plastics and trash and chemicals, chemicals in it. So that's, you know, when you're looking at water security and the safety of the water and the, you know, we're not just looking at water and from melting water in Arctic polar glaciers, but also in other cryosphere regions. So the Himalayas, for example, you know, 12 different countries rely on the Himalayas for their water security. They're relying on the Himalayas, India and China for, actual energy security and their transition away from fossil fuels. And we're melting these at such a rate that we're not actually gonna have, not gonna have that source of water security. But uh, leading to conflict over water security, foods, ecosystem, et cetera. So we were trying to get in a little bit in that area, trying to, what kind of research can they be doing there that we can be, we can be testing out. So this is some fishing, fishing line that I pulled out of the, frozen ice or out of the ice at about 80 or so degrees north. And this was just abandoned stuff that had gotten into the water system. So finding a lot of, a lot of plastics and a lot of trash and you could find some of the bigger pieces and some pieces, you know, the size of me, it would actually have a stamp on it as to where it was made. So you could, you know, actually find the stuff that was from all continents. And basically with the ocean current system, it gets in the currents and it ends up in the poles just because that's sort of a, a good terminus for, for that. So. Um, but also finding that these chemical, uh, plastics are getting into, into the ecosystem as well. So finding them in, in fish, in the flesh of fish. Uh, birds that were here, we, did, we saw birds when we were on the coast. So not when we were certainly out in the sea ice, didn't see any, and when we were up in the mountains, didn't see any. Uh, but along the coast, we saw especially a species known as the northern fulmar bird. It's kind of gull-like. And plastic ingestion would kill about 90% of them. And that's partly from ingesting the plastic and actually suffocating, but also sometimes ingesting the plastic and then therefore not eating because the bird assumed it, had e it felt full. So it would, it would die of starvation. Uh, but there were other actual cool things we found in the water. And... <laughs> Uh, this is a tree stump, and as you can see, it's still got a bit of a root system. There aren't trees here. This tree, and you can see several logs up there, initially thought that maybe we'd come across some kind of shipwreck. Like, well, why would you have a shipwreck with tree roots in it and branches? So it turned out these trees also get into the water ocean circulation system, and you can date and type them. And these were trees from the Yukon Basin at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, that, you know, that kind of thing was really, was really cool because you actually start to retrace what the historical currents, what were the prevailing currents at different times, how have those changed? And so there were really cool things we found in the water too. And so Macmillan, one of his sort of contributions, as he's put it, in the research side was being able to use the first shortwave radio in the uh, in the polar regions. So we uh, we did the communications as well, figuring that if we're out there, we need to make sure that what we're doing is going to benefit as many people as we can. So certainly on the science side, that also meant we did a lot of citizen science work. So call and 
with free universities, calling up universities, calling up institutions and saying, you know, what kind of research do you need? Because we're going to be in an area where other people are generally not. So instead of dropping off somebody by helicopter and using all of those emissions, what can we do? So I did work for NASA, I did work for Uppsala University and several other international, international groups when they had data that they needed collecting. But part of that was also the communications, you know, what are we seeing and how can we, how can we share it? So uh, I was mic'd up the entire time, as I guess I am now. So that was, that was entertaining because at times when I was seeing nothing but white, so ski, and just skiing, and the inside of my goggles, uh, icing over, definitely hallucinating a few times, and I would commentate on this to keep myself entertained. And I'm pretty sure whoever's actually in charge of going through all of that footage also heard about the monkeys I saw in the snow. <laughs> but also did some podcasting on various, various uh, things that we were seeing and different experiences and what each of us was, was doing there and what our, what our roles were. So some podcasting there. And then I'm in the image, well, the two images towards me on the left, uh, called into the World Economic Forum via satellite phone there and I had given them some images in advance that they were sharing over with my my talk so so part of this whole recording thing also meant that nothing was ever actually really private so here I am supposed to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation uh, and uh, the story is basically I'm on polar bear watch there with my rifle and my cup of my mug of tea my mug of tea has a little like I love Maine sticker on it. So there's that. But we also in the spot, this is this was right off the off the ice. And in the end of May, early June. And so things were pretty much we're melting, melting really rapidly. And so we were off the ice and we decided that we were gonna have our own little climate summit of now that we're done with this, what have we what have we discussed? So the six of us got together, we found these logs again. I don't remember where these ones are from, but they had come from some come from some other part of the world, and we we made them into a little horseshoe shape and sat around and spoke about what we would have if this our sort of our mission to world leaders. Uh, we couldn't decide whether it was the most democratic or the least democratic uh, climate summit, in that everybody was invited, but there were six of us, so that was that was still out there. And got off, and I went straight to Stockholm to talk about this at the uh, Stockholm Plus 50 Summit, which was the 50th anniversary of the first Global Climate Summit. So that is, that is me talking. Actually, what I didn't share with the Nordenskjöld expedition is they got ice in, and they were iced in at 80 degrees north when they had to set out on skis. This is me. Uh, this photograph is of that spot where they got iced in and there's a little structure that they had built out of the driftwood. And uh, I was collecting water samples. So I was down there just right on the ice where they were stuck for two years on the, you know, get out if you can. And I was just messing with liquid water. So that was, that was a little scary. But... And then, yeah, I've just spent the last, the last year uh, talking, talking about it, but talking really about the polar science and the implications of why the poles are especially important for global stability and global risk. So how do those link into global patterns of health, for example, vector-borne diseases, wildfires, et cetera, that we're seeing around the world. And a couple more images to share. But this, this here was at the World Economic Forum in January, where we were launching an agenda, a polar climate agenda item. So, there at about two in the morning, finishing the talk that I was supposed to be writing. And then also doing some individual executive briefings with heads of state and global CEOs for off record meetings about why, why the climate is important and really trying to use a lot of my experiences to talk with them uh, to get them to really figure out why, why they care, when, especially when they're not necessarily people who really feel that this is something that they, they do care about naturally. So for example, uh, a company that says they don't, one company, for example, said that they don't really care, frankly, they bottom line, they're looking at their in, in uh, the amount of income and that's what they care about and saying, okay, well, that's great. What do you need? 
Like, well, as long as we have water, that's great. Okay, and they're used to being able to just, you know, water might be more expensive, but you pay for it, who cares? And saying, okay, well, where do you get your water? And what is the security of that water in five years? And realizing that this one international company that you all definitely know had not thought about where they're getting water in five years, nor had they realized that where they're getting water now is 40% more water insecure in five years. And suddenly after that, they were saying, okay, well, how do we get, how do we actually do something about this? So really helping people realize why the resources that they rely on are important. How do you care about the resources? And then what kind of actions need to be happening as a result of that? And then just, this is, these are two projects that I'm, well, one is the, the bottom graph there is another image of Svalbard from this, this uh, earlier in March, we had a, a warming spell in March, March 3rd or so that in Greenland got up to 90 degrees above its average temperature for this time of year in parts of it. So had some melt going on there. And the graph in the upper side is last year's Greenland melt. And the only thing that really is wanting to show with that is that the red line, if you can see it, is, is last year's melt. The gray behind it is averages over different, different time periods. But what we're seeing is that melt is not something that's really happening in the summer season as much as it was. It used to be a very a good melt season and then a freeze up season and then the cycle. What we're seeing now is melt that's starting to go into the shoulder season. So it's starting earlier than the year and it's continuing later. So having spikes that, you know, end of, end of August, September into October that are the type of melt that we'd be normally used to seeing in July, for example, or that in March 3rd, it can be 90 degrees above average. Uh, so then the globe here is a project that I'm working on now that is using climate trace data, which is tracking real-time atmospheric carbon emissions, and it monitors human-caused greenhouse gas emissions through artificial intelligence, machine learning, modeling, satellite, remote sensing, et cetera. And being able to figure out, so using that data, but also what are the global disasters that are happening around the world and how are those, how, what, what is the role of the polar regions in those? And then working with, again, with heads of state on that. And then just, a, just an image to sort of make things a little bit more, a little bit more personal is this, this app that, again, working on. And this is just showing that if, if we were actually in the Arctic, uh, or if, if this were the Arctic and we're talking about melt, for example, how, what is the relation between emissions and melt? So I've taken Portland Jetport, since most of you have been there, or if not all of you. So how, the amount of emissions that Portland Jetport releases per week. If Freeport were the Arctic, what is the direct correlation of how much Freeport would melt? So. The answer, uh, so the amount of Arctic that melts as a result of the emissions generated by Portland Jetport per week is the same as an area of, of town from Starbucks to the Jameson Tavern. So, you know, that's what we're getting around the world all, all the time. Um, and I was, I completely forgot about this part. <laughs> so a little cheesy to do it at the end, but I'm gonna do it anyway. How many, I, and this was gonna be a nicer bottle, but again, that's at my house. So how many of these, so this is a one liter bottle, 32, just about 32 ounces. How many of these could I fill based on the melt rate? If I were to collect all of the melt water from Greenland, how many of these would I need to fill per second? Per second, full. So it's one liter. Any guesses? That's actually the first time somebody's guessed a higher number than higher than a million. Millions, uh, yeah, 13 million of these per second. Per second. So, so that's just you know that's the rate at which we're we're talking about for for numbers. So, with that, I will. I will close, so thank you.
you have a time for a few questions. Um, and I will bring the mic to you. And you would like to ask. <laughs> I'm I'm a little confused about the route you took. I from the pictures anyway, I get the feeling that the predominance of the time you were on or very near land. How far did you actually get? So we I think we ended up we were supposed to do about six hundred kilometers and we did a, probably about three hundred three hundred kilometers cumulatively. Um, on, on but the, we spent Part of that, part of that was sea ice, and part of that was through trekking through Svalbard on the glaciers there, and then ultimately had to call for rescue off the sea ice. So, how far, again, how far from land did you get? I meant to bring that map. <laughs> Not terribly, and we actually at one point had fog coming in because of the uh, the amount of melt. And open water. How far would it have been if you? How far w was your starting point from the pole? So had we had we so we were we started about five hundred miles from the North Pole or so. <clears throat> but you know when we're we we're gonna go probably about half of that. Did you get even fifty from land? About. Huh. Be curious. The other thing is back to the crevasses. Yes. Is, is that almost exclusively an over um, ice, uh, land ice, or, or glacier problem? Yes. Not, not over water. No, so with over the water, we were having the ice leads. You have leads, ice, but not crevasses. The ice in the open yeah. water, and the crevasses were <clears throat> much more, the, I mean, you could fall through the, uh, the rafting of the ice, but that would be a different issue. That was, that was on the glaciers, and so that was an issue that we had on Svalbard. Specifically, mm -hmm. but getting into the surging lasers. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I have a question, uh, Susanna. Um, you talked about the difference, uh, m m some of the many differences between um, the sort of outlook of polar exploration 150 years ago, certainly with Perry and McMillan and, and others. Um, if you had to forecast, maybe not 150 years from now, but maybe even 50 years from now, into what someone else might be doing instead of what you were doing. Could you see what, what differences there might be in the future in terms of polar travel? Yeah, so uh, one of the big differences is that it's becoming uh, something you'd rather do in a kayak. And not sure there's there have been some expeditions in the past 10 years or so that have attempted to ski to the North Pole over especially from Canada and Russia direction and that's been doable but over the past 10 years it's really becoming not doable and so but there's there's a lot of work now looking into new technologies and sort of not a research as in what the science is but a research as in like how can we change sort of trajectory of humanity, for example. So I don't, I mean, that's, that's sort of one area in which, which things are going. Uh, beyond that, I honestly haven't really given that much thought. I don't know. I'd be interested in knowing how you were actually rescued. What, what? Yeah, it's a very boring story. Uh, I cannot imagine where you were that it was boring. So I, we had a marine radio. We, so we had a satellite phone that we could use, and we had actually called somebody. I have a, I had a, uh, some, we were in touch with some researchers as well who, study, who were studying the sea ice and very familiar with the area. And so I had been in touch with them. I had a little uh, satellite unit, satellite texting unit. And so I could send a text that would take, you know, an hour to send, and I might get a message that response the next day type thing. And so I've been communicating with them and we knew that we were going to get into some issues. So we had made some phone calls with tentative arrangements. So, you know, our people are out there that could get a boat to us. 
And then we thought, you know, once once we realized that this was getting a little bit soggy and I'm skiing through stuff up to my knees, uh, we decided that maybe we'd just get on our marine radio and see if anybody responded. And uh, a ship sailing up from northern Norway responded and said that they would uh, not be terribly far from us in a little bit. We couldn't see them, but uh, they came over and we basically skied to the edge of the edge of the ice and they, they jammed their boat right into the uh, into the ice. They had a little tender, so they anchored their boat into wedged their big boat into the ice and then they took out their tender and took that right right over to us and they had some massive life jackets that are sort of survival suit style. So we all piled into those and got into their tender and onto their ship. One right here. Is the documentary available to watch that was being created? Uh, not yet. So I think it's I, I think it's scheduled to come out this fall, but I don't know what the what the process is. If it's film festivals or I think they wanted to do that rather than direct release, but I don't know yet. There's a question over here. So you mentioned you'd been to 50 below, but looking at the pictures, it doesn't look like it was 50 below. What was the temperature range that you had on your expedition? I believe the temperature range you had was about 125 degrees Fahrenheit wow. in range. So yeah, there were there were times where I would have, had I not been concerned about the sun, would have been in a t-shirt. But uh, definitely had a sun hat and and a very thin thin top. And so one of the folks who was one of the two guides, did they organize all the equipment for you? Did they, were, were you well equipped for that? Or did you all just get your own stuff together? So we up? had, we had sponsored equipment for good parts of it, where we said, this is, this is the basics that we needed. And that was, that was provided for us. Uh, we were individually, I was concerned about being cold. And so I brought warmer you know, some of my base layers, for example, I brought warmer base layers than I necessarily needed to, and actually warmer than the ones that were provided for me. Uh, so there was a mixture. Um, and I often found that, especially as the expedition wore on, I was, I would get hot skiing. I mean, one of the concerns is that you can't sweat because if you sweat, you get, there's moisture and nothing dries and then that gets cold. So, I was, you know, parts of me, my feet would be in plastic bags. I had cooking, turkey cooking bags. I got a bow street. Um, so I had my feet in those the entire time uh, in my boots. <laughs> and, you know, you take, your, take the boots off and then you have to let your feet vaporize and dry until you can put something else on. And uh, having to sleep in plastic or a vapor barrier, uh, which again, vapor barrier had to arrive. So I had a, basically one of those survival blanket baby sack things, which you sweat, it freezes, yeah, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to get my, I'd have to wake up in the morning, take it outside, let it air out, which would just take a second or two, the sweat would freeze and like shake it out and have this little sweat snowstorm. And so, was, you know, things like that, that we just had to do sort of daily. Uh, but I found that I could, while skiing, I'd get pretty warm, except my hands would get really cold. And I don't know why my hands were so cold. I had huge gloves that before I went thought would only be good for polar bear boxing. And I would wear those with artificial hand warmers. And I would still at times have to warm my hands. And the way to do that is to stick them in the armpits of somebody else. So I was with five men and they rotated an armpit hole for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, yeah, there was, I found that I was I, both very cold at times and also you know, moderately okay. Um, we did have, you know, anytime, anytime we stopped skiing, it was, you know, put on layers of everything, down pants that would go over the trousers I was wearing, several down jackets that just got thrown on immediately, uh, just to try to stay warm. And we stopped. Oops. Now, what months were you there again? I set out at the end of April. Okay. So April, uh, end of April, May, and then into June. Okay, great. So you're there three months. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, 
Did anything surprise you? Did you find that you weren't expecting? Uh, I mean, I wasn't, I think there's a difference between things I was expecting and things that I had sort of not wanted to be expecting. So for example, I certainly wasn't expecting to find plastics. I, like, I, mean, I knew that they were out there, but then reaching in and taking water samples and saying, oh, I just want to test this and realize here's water that's a thousand miles from a human being and it's not safe to drink. So I think, you know, the degree to which everything, you know, finding glaciers that were collapsing at 75, 80 degrees north, in, in the same way that we see these glaciers collapsing in the European Alps, which is a much, much more temperate area, and seeing stuff that's happening that satellites haven't really given us data yet. And sat I mean, satellites, they, they have, may have recorded some of this, but it takes about a year or so for it to be analyzed. So actually seeing things that theoretically we don't know about yet. We haven't, we don't have that data. So I think the rate to which that was happening and how many things we were finding that people were calling us up to say, hey, we can't get satellite data on this yet. What, what are you seeing? Was, was it pretty shocking? So. Suzanne. I have to ask the obvious question. Were you the only woman or the only woman in the expedition yeah and, uh, so which was so much fun when we were all roped together and i had a pee <laughs> so i thought a couple of, of stories around that might be interesting but you just told one yeah um i also i didn't yeah so i, I was with five men four of whom were lovely one of whom was our communal polar bear contribution if we needed to make one and I, uh, but no, it was, it was interesting. It was an experience. Uh, and, but we generally all got along really well. And I did feel that I had to, this one person that was a little bit of a challenge for me would make comments throughout, for example, such as, oh, you know, you've got a bit of snow on your bag. Wouldn't want to have to carry more weight now, would you? type thing. And it would be, you know, this little dusting of snow that, you know, you put the bag in the snow and pick it up and it just hasn't fallen off yet. So you'd make comments like that, but then that basically meant that on our, right after he, he there were a couple of those that just were sure, because at the time I also couldn't work the stove and I was the only one who couldn't work the stove. So I was also feeling like I was just, you know, earning my idiot points pretty quickly. So then I had, uh, we were going up a hill and this one person who was about 40 kilos heavier than I am, we all set out with the same amount of weight in our bags, our kit, our sleds. I thought we should do it proportional to body size, being the smallest person there. But uh, that was vetoed by everybody else. Uh, but we had one guy and, you know, to his credit, he'd been ill and various things like that prior, but uh, he wasn't making it up the hill. So I just being a bit cocky about it, I was like, well, why don't I just take your sled then? You know, if you're gonna be... So he opened up his sled and he tossed me the safety kit. He tossed me all the spares. He tossed me all the rifle, uh, the bullets and um, all sorts of things. And I got it up and I went to give it back to him. It was probably about 20, 30 kilos of stuff. And he's like, no, 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 I have no take backs. So it uh, turns out that my sled was actually, if not, the second heaviest for the entire expedition, um, but I couldn't complain about it because I needed to make sure I kept my kept my points. Um, but they did describe me as the hamster because I was just like running right up at the front because I had to just like I think just with one or two altercations in the beginning, I had to just feel like I didn't want to I didn't want it to anybody to sort of use me as a reason why we weren't accomplishing anything. So. How, how much total stuff did you have to carry? I should have shown a picture of that. Actually, I'm going to be able to. Um, so I carried about 150 pounds of stuff in my sled. And sleds were great because I said that we lost, we did damage a tent. We were able to fix it. but And we did have, we brought three tents two four-person and one three-person, and we used two people per, which meant that if we did lose a tent, also because it's so windy, 
it can easily lose a ton by just letting go of it, for example, not having it staked properly. It's just, it's gone. Um, we would have enough tents for people, but our, our, um, our, our sleds also, we could sleep in them if we needed to, and you can zip yourself into them. So I brought uh, three, not too much, three shirts, for example, one of which was a sleeping, started off as a sleeping only shirt, having to deal with the balance of making sure I was warm at night with sweat and stuff. So, and then one lightweight and then one moderate. And I ended up, I think after a week, just wearing the same shirt for the rest of the time. Um, lots of food. I think food was probably the heaviest, the heaviest thing. Um, clothing was, wasn't too much. Because a lot of it was down and very lightweight fabrics that could be quite warm. But yeah, food and fuel were probably our two, our two heavy things. So I can maybe find a picture of all my stuff. Among the uh, six people on the expedition, was there any hierarchy or how were um, things decided that weren't where everybody wasn't in congruence with each other? Um, so I don't, there wasn't so much hierarchy as there were different people with different expertise. So when we had two people who were doing the filming, you know, they made the decision. Sometimes we were in a certain work pattern and they would stop us and say, we have to change patterns. Uh, I had a lot of the technical expertise, sort of the scientific oversight. And then we had one person who was our key, our key safety, key safety person. So. Hi. Um, I was reading a book a little while ago about exploration in Antarctica. Yep. And a failed expedition and the incredible hardships they went through. And I was just wondering if you're considering anything in Antarctica. Uh, my parents are in the audience, so I probably can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that I was, yeah, so that, that, that's a picture of everything I brought with me. Um, so I think the last 10 days or so were really hard for me because it's like, this is my, it was so amazing to be out of technology and just out of out of everything just feeling like i'm just out by myself um skiing and taking in so much and learning so much that i was really gonna miss that so yes <laughs> and i may have a conversation about it at four in the morning so um that may already be on the books is, did you have a, a technical method of measuring the depth of the ice along your, your path? Uh, so where we measured, there are set measuring spots that had been established. And so we would measure those because that enables measurements to be consistent. So, and then, you know, at parts of it, sometimes there's just simply an avalanche pole, which would just be measured, had, you know, like having measurements on it. So some of it was simply going up to these little stations and dropping an avalanche ball and seeing where it landed. So some of it was very, very simple, and some of it was uh, a little bit more, more involved. And what was the typical thickness, thickness of the so, ice? So it, it completely depended on areas, different areas. So on a glacier, for example, some areas were maybe 200 centimeters. Hmm. And, but it would be, it would be sort of, Sorry, that's, that's not quite right. It would be, we were looking at different seasonal depths. So it was how much snow has happened in this season, how much snow has happened last season. We, didn't, we never got into how deep is the overall, overall area. And, and you know, how much has happened this season depends, you know, if you're in an area where there's a lot of wind, that's gonna take out a lot. If you're in an area that is getting a little bit more warmth, that can pack more, so. Back around that side. Oh, we've got. I got another question. So, do you start out at an ice station where you have to sign in before you decide to go out to another? I mean, I'm sure it's all assigned and monitored, but to another area where you ended up? No. Oh, okay. No, the only time I had to sign in for anything was the rifle range. I'm going to shoot. 
Um, no, um, but that said, I did check in via text with uh, the with somebody who was sort of monitoring our progress and did do a few sort of podcasts along the route in which I was checking in with other people. But we did have somebody that nightly was a okay, we've pitched tents and here are here's our location. And when I'd send a text, I could send a hey, how are you? Limited to 40 characters. Or I could send, I could ask, I could tell it to send a map and it would pinpoint my exact location to about 15 decimal points in the lat lawn, uh, wherever I was, which didn't necessarily mean anything it's out in the middle of sea ice. It's just a little Dot. But it also meant that it would create a map and you could follow along about where, where we were going to. So people could see where we were and as long as I as long as I sent a text. So we did check in that way. You were recreating a route and you said you came to these different stations that existed. How many stations are there and how are people getting to these different places? So, yeah, so I should say that the stations, the measuring stations that we were doing, this was a lot of the, okay, we're going, we need to do research while we're there, want to do research. So there were only stations in some areas. So uh, really only the last week, last couple of days where we actually at stations. Are there camps all over? Oh, oh. Are there stations all over the Arctic? Are there few? Are there many? So when we were camping, it was just, you know, got tired at the end of the day and pitched a tent. Uh, there are research stations around the Arctic, and none, we weren't near any of them. Where we had sort of research stations were, were places where they're monitoring glacial surge, for example, and that would be a university that will either helicopter somebody in or you'll spend several days on a snowmobile, for example, going in. So, so they were sort of that kind of station, as in like you're, you're just getting dropped off and picked up, not overwintering stations or camping stations, but th those do exist as well. You're welcome. Who, who is we? I mean, uh, is this part of an organization? And or who was, where was the funding coming from? Yeah, good question. So we made a nonprofit for the funding purposes, but no. Who's um, we? Who's we? Just the six of you? Yeah, the six of us. So we were in our search for funding. I uh, found a footnote in a journal from 1872 that they were funded by a Swedish bank, Carnegie Bank. And we knew they were still in existence, so we gave them a ring and said, we did this in 1872. Would you like to do it now? <laughs> um, uh, they said sure what do you want so uh we we put in our we we gave them a number and they they agreed to that number so we ended up actually being funded by the same same organization which was really great i uh, we did have a little bit this is sort of part of this ongoing project too is you know are we taking money from a bank and banks are notoriously not exactly in pro-environmentally progressive so they actually were, at the same time we were there, they were, they sent a group of their employees up to the Arctic to have a look-see just for a, you know, a weekend jet, uh, jet back. So our agreement with them was, yes, we'll take your money, thank you very much, but what can we be doing when we get back to work with you on your transitions? Because they had a lot of ideas of how to, associate themselves with fossil fuels and some of their corporate practices, but not exactly the knowledge of how to do that. And so we we basically said, you know, after you know, we'll take your money on one condition and that's that we work with you to become more environmentally friendly. And so that was sort of a win-win for us. And uh, so that's something that we've been working on a little bit this year. So the, the six of you were just a bunch of old friends that you got together, or how'd you I put this? I none of us knew any either. I mean, we didn't know each other. So who put the whole thing? How did this thing come together? So one person, uh, so one per I mean, one person sort of thought about this during COVID, and he was a photographer, expedition leader, and not in 
in some areas in the polar regions, but not this time, usually by ship, for example, and thought that was reading a book on the North Shore Expedition and realized that two years later was going to be the 150th anniversary. So why not, you know, spend, spend the COVID time putting that together and seeing what we could recreate. So that was sort of the kernel of the idea. And then he actually, he did know one person. He knew one person, they lived near each other, both from Sweden, who was a photographer uh, and did a bit of video, videography. And that person knew somebody who had done some videography with the BBC on some of their um, uh, Blue Planet, et cetera, footages. And so hooked us up with him. So then we kind of got the crew, the film team side together. And then they put out a call for scientists. And so they opened it up to scientists from around the world to apply. Basically saying, you know, what is your contribution to the mission, to the expedition? What research are you doing? And how would that research benefit the community beyond, beyond just the six group going? And then we collectively looked for a technical guy together. And that was again somebody that none of us, none of us knew until we actually got there. But the five of us minus the tech guy had met ahead of time. We did a smaller expedition in northern Sweden together. So we did get to know each other a little bit. And yeah. Will Pine finding to be published? I'm not yet. So I have written a few things. I have spoken at COP27 in Egypt about this in Stockholm. And I think I've been in about 25 countries in the past year talking about things like this at various international conferences. Uh, so, you know, certainly that kind of findings, you know, it's been disseminated that way. Are working on a book that will be coming out and the, the uh, documentary and also an exhibition, a photography exhibition that will be coming. It's, slated for January that hopefully we'll be traveling around. And so there'll be some things coming out with that as well. I haven't published scientific papers. I'm not sure. I have I have some that are half written. I have thoughts about that. I'm not sure if that's where I'm gonna go. I have a lot of journals and diaries, some of which I promised Eric. Uh, so we'll see. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susanna, for sharing all of this. Uh, I want to acknowledge that, as Susanna said, she's been in 25 countries in the last year, trying to find a time when she could speak with us here in the town where she actually lives um, was a bit of a challenge. But we're so glad that we were able to find this opportunity for uh, all of you to hear about um, not only the exciting expedition, but all of the things that Susanna has been doing since then. So thank and you very much. One more thing. It's just um, noting on your way out, uh, the, there's the Climate Action Plan and some information about that. There's the Midtown Forum on climate, Local Vulnerabilities on the 15th of May. And Kristen Dorsey should be out there with some information with those website. And so I just wanted to just uh, draw your attention on the way out if you want to have a look-see at that. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.